please give a warm welcome to our keynote, Deepsha Mangani. Woo! Big friend of the art. Hi, President Trump. There we go. So we're going to share the screen. OK. Thank you. Awesome. So I am here to talk about why is everybody, including myself right now, is talking about generated AI. And before I get started, who here has heard about ChatGPT? Just raise your hand. Whew, otherwise, this talk would have been very boring. Glad to know. So recently, my friend texted me this. Deepsha, I can't believe I missed your birthday by a week. I am so sorry I did not reach out to you on that day. Happy belated birthday. I hope you had an absolutely amazing day. And I thought that was a very, very thoughtful message. So I really wanted to put thought into returning the message back. So I asked ChatGPT to put the thought for me. <laughs> Why is that the case? You can read a lot of scientific journals on Reddit threads about millennials. And this is how that went. Let me formulate a response to my friend's text, and ChatGPT came back saying, your thoughtful message is sincerely appreciated. While the passing of my birthday went unnoticed, your belated well wishes have touched my heart. Gratefully, your name. Who talks like that? I <laughs> do not talk like that to my friends or my acquaintances. So I said, hey, can you dial it down a little with the formality? And it came back saying, OMG. <laughs> Don't even worry about missing my B day. Life gets crazy sometimes, you know? Thanks a bunch for the belated wishes, girl. So I said, well, that also does not sound like me. If you had chatted with me or texted with me, you know that. So I said, can you do something in the middle of those two? That's crazy. So I said, came back saying, thank you so much for the sweet message. No worries at all. I truly appreciate your belated birthday wishes. It means a lot to me. And my friend had a thoughtful response back. And that is what generated AI is able to do. According to ChatGPT's definition, it is a, an artificial intelligence that takes the data that has been fed into it, learns from the trends of data, and is able to generate new data content, whether it's text or images or video from learned data. Let's take the example of my five-month-old daughter, Ellie. Now, she is in the process of absorbing a whole lot of information. Consider her brain this LLM example where she is absorbing information and eventually she will start understanding the trends between the data. So eventually, if I ask her to say, hey, sprinkle, sprinkle, she might guess the next word is little and the next word is star. She may not know the meaning of what does sprinkle mean, but she is able to understand the trends between how words come together to guess the next best word. Now to cover a few concepts, my in-laws love to drop the F and I don't want my daughter to fucking learn it. So <laughs> when she does, when my daughter does repeat that word, I go like, hey, I know your brain is an LLM, but as an output, I want you to not use that word because I don't want to get a call from your daycare coming to me to pick you up. And that is me as a human intervening and telling it what output is okay, what is not, and feeding that back. And that is reinforcing what's okay as an output and what's not. And so that's reinforcement learning. Another example, my daughter loves books. A lot of those books, as we all know, start with once upon a time. Two of her books go, once upon a time, a puppy and a cat were playing. And another book goes, once upon a time, a little girl was playing in the park. And so at night, when I'm reading to her, I pick up the book about the puppy and the cat. And I say, hey, will you complete the story for me? Can I help me say the story? And I say, hey, once upon a time, can you tell me what happened? She looks at that data. Like, think of that book as the data set I have provided. She looks at that context of like the images, and she says, oh, I know. Once upon a time, a puppy and a cat were playing together. And think of that as me giving her a data set, me giving an LLM a data set and saying, when I ask you a question, forget about everything else you have learned from the internet or anywhere or any other book. Go to this data set. Use that context and provide me the response. Retrieve the response from there. And that is your retrieval augmented generation. 
So just to get concepts out of the way, when everybody started talking about generative AI, I, a lot of us, including myself, felt fear of missing out, right? Like everybody's talking about it. But then people moved on to building really cool things with AI, not just talking about it, but just building amazing things. And very quickly I moved on to four here with some MDS, which is basically fear of, holy cow, why is everybody talking about generative AI? Panic mode, where do I even start? And that is where I'm hoping we're going to take the talk today, which is let's spark creative ideas, look all around us on where you can build and start using generative AI. And also, as you start building those scenarios, what are the implications of that? Before we start, let's start with TAP or Cascadia Agenda Bot. So I took an LLM, Large Language Model API, and gave it the agenda data from Cascadia and so that if a user asks that question, it receives the information about the agenda and answers that. And this is what that looks like. First, I love Shiny, so I wanted to know if there are sessions about Shiny there. And looks like there's gonna be four sessions. Amazing, I cannot wait for those. And then I do a lot of machine learning at work, so I wanted to know what uh, sessions are there about tidy models. And awesome, we have that answer. Now I love communities, I've talked about that. So I wanted to know what time Lydia is going to talk, and I'm very, very excited for that talk. And it looks like we have that. Now the most important question that's on everybody's mind, what time is the lunch break? <laughs> now based on old data, not the latest, it tells me that and tells me, hey, there's these other breaks that you might be interested in, just in case. And that is where the power of generative AI comes through where you don't just use it directly, but you utilize it for your scenario and you make it your own with your data. And the matrix of generated AI scenarios, and we've kind of touched upon that with some examples already, this is direct, so you give it a prompt, you get the response, and it's a text message. Customize, where you give it a prompt, you ask it to go look at a certain data, and then use that data to give you a prompt response back. And then at a commercial scale, it can get more complex, where you can ask it, hey, I'm giving you a prompt, maybe based on that, you need to make the decision whether it's a segmentation or a classification problem. Once you have that decision made, go to the data, take one of those two actions, evaluate the output, and feed the response back into the decision-making process. Let's look at this through industry examples. I'm gonna talk about finance first. So the direct example is simple, financial literacy. Let's look at a customize. Now, Ellis wanted to know how he has spent his last year's money. And so he takes his entire last year's bank statement and puts it, including receipts, puts it, gives it to an LLM API and says, hey, can you bucket my expenses? And also, not only that, can you help me understand what can I do to improve them? And it comes back saying, beautiful segmentation of all the buckets, and then comes back saying, dear Ellis, you've been spending $60 a week on avocado toast for a week. <laughs> Maybe it's time to learn to make it at home. And yes, I agree. Guys were going crazy on this. Let's look at a commercial scenario. Fraud detection. Now, why is fraud detection a great scenario for generative AI? Because generative AI can learn from the past fraud scenarios that have happened and generate new synthetic data based on those two scenarios. So what else could fraud be? Not only that, as a new fraud scenario would come in, which nowadays as sophisticated as it is starting to get, a new scenario comes in, in real time, it is able to understand, learn from that scenario, and adapt to it to recognize future fraud. This is why fraud scenario, not just in finance, but any industry where there are transactions, it's really picking up. Let's look at healthcare, because I know in Pacific Northwest, we're in need of food of medicine, so. A health routine development, simple example, I wanna start running shopping spree. Let's customize it. So JD went to the doctors, and got a report with 25 complicated labels and charts. And none of us can ever make heads and tails of this, let's be real. So imagine if there was a, in her medical health app, there was a bot where she could put this chart information and get a summarized version of, can you tell me in plain English, what do these charts mean and what does it mean for me to do to take care of myself? And that is verified by the doctor saying, okay, yeah, this, Actually, the output does make sense. It was pretty accurate. That would really improve the patient and doctor experience. Let's look at another commercial example, 
where within image processing, it's really picked up. So MRI scans and CT scans, let's say, they are not always the best quality. So first, before I cover the quality, just having an image and doing a preliminary diagnosis and determining in English what is that image telling me so that the physician can look at it, understand the accuracy, and come to the diagnosis much faster. So really making the process efficient. Another example is image enhancement and reconstruction. Let's say um, the, the MRI scan or CT scans aren't the best quality, and some parts of it, in fact, are missing. Because it has learned from past data and it can generate new content, it is able to almost fill in the blanks within the MRI scan about what is missing. It can also enhance the image where let's enhance the parts that are actually need to be diagnosed to help the physician get to the diagnosis faster. So it's really cool and exciting. Now education, we all have understand we love learning. Uh, when me and my partner found out that the birth mom is about to be in labor and we were absolutely not ready to be parents, our chat GPD was filled with questions like, how do you change the di diaper? How, when does the baby go to sleep? How do you keep the baby alive? And <laughs> really, that's what it was filled with. And then me and my partner got into an argument saying, how much should the baby sleep during the daytime, during nap? Kids sleep better during the nighttime. And this is where LMs are really helpful in resolving magic issues. So we go to ChatGPT, ask the question, and why is that under education? Because I'm not going to tell you which one of us ended up being correct, but the other one got confused. <laughs> uh, it was me. Let's take the customized example now. Let's say Jacqueline's daughter, Amber, loves chicken, six years old, but she doesn't like math assignments. Imagine having an LLM API where Jacqueline can put the curriculum of her daughter and it tells them that, hey, make up a fun quiz with this curriculum and maybe include chickens in there. And the LLM comes back saying, totally. Three chickens went to a party. One of those chickens ate a shit ton of pigs and got <laughs> sick, so left the party early. How many chickens are left? That is so much better than killing C minus one pig. Let's look at a commercial example. If you have heard about Khan Academy, and I grew up with Khan Academy, and I absolutely love it, Sal Khan talks about a reasoning and content generation in education. So here's a snapshot from Sal Khan's TED talk about the Khan Migo bot within Khan Academy that is meant for both students and teachers. So for a student, let's say the student is working on a problem and goes to, Chat G, goes to the Khan Migo bot and asks the question, hey, can you tell me the answer? The bot comes back saying, well, I cannot tell you the answer, but I see that you've approached the problem in a certain way. How about have you tried something like this? Imagine having a safe space to go back and forth while you're learning a new thing. How amazing is that? It's the next level of education. And then when you turn it in teacher mode, which is a snapshot here, it's in teacher mode, says, hey, I'm about to teach the Spanish-American War. Can you give me a good hook to teach that to my students? And it comes back saying, that's a great point. How about a role-playing activity where you can assign groups of students a country to play in the Spanish-American War? I wish I had studied history that way. It was just so much fun. Great, we looked at industry examples, but there are so many other industries that we can keep talking about. Fashion, agriculture, where it is starting to play a part. But what about you? Where, wherever you are in the journey, where do you look around you and just start using generative AI to either build something or make yourself efficient? And let's start with an example of direct. This is a snapshot from Thomas Mock's talk about GitHub Copilot and Chatter, where GitHub Copilot allows you to do code assisted, which means that you add comments in there and it turns those comments into code, which is different than autocomplete, because autocomplete completes the word that you're typing, but Copilot understands the intent of what you're trying to do. The more you code, the better your responses of your Copilot are going to become, because it understands the context more and more. And here, this is a snapshot that I took of what that looks like. You can, it's in ghost mode, so you can either take the suggestion or ignore it. But I specifically took the snapshot from Tom's talk about the regex, because let's face it, in our entire data science journey, we have at least one horror story about dealing with regex, and these are some of them. Another example is synthetic data generation. So on the left-hand side is my prompt, where I, I use this synthetic data generation for just understanding concepts concepts and writing blogs where I don't have a specific data set to explain the concept. And here I said, 
hey, I want a, stri a, a column with names, make sure the names are funny. So it came up with Giggles, Boomer, Snicker, and other funny names. And repeat each name seven times, have a corresponding second column with day of week for those seven rows, and have a third column for commute hours, which should be between 30 to 90 minutes. And not only that, within each name, the commute hours should be close to each other, and overall within the data, they should follow a normal now I gave it so many conditions and it came back with this Excel sheet that I can now use for understanding or explaining a very common concept. I've linked a blog here, Learn Tiny for Python with Excel sheets back to where I used it to write code for me to generate a random number for the data and it's not coupled to my heuristic, so I'm not using it by the way. Now this here is a readme file from my last year's talk of demystifying shiny modules. And look at, it's got prerequisites, how to install, how to run the app, what does my app structure look like, um, authors and what the data set details are. And I generated this using LLM. So imagine if all, if you build an LLM app that just takes your code as context and your GitHub file repo structure and every single time returns you the same type of consistent readme structure and your entire GitHub readme and not just a readme file, but just generally creating your documentation using that LLM. Now I love this scenario. So picture this, you have a beautiful shiny dashboard that you have created. It has a lot of amazing charts and everything. And it has a chart called churn over time. And when a user wants to know how churn is calculated, like it can be over one month, two months, three months, six months, we don't know. But when a user wants to know how it's calculated, you probably have a wiki link or a documentation link somewhere that you take them to with 20 pages of documentation saying, hey, go find whatever you're looking for in this. But what if you had a bot at the corner of your shiny dashboard that you have fed your documentation data into that when a user comes in and says, hey, how, what is churn and how is it calculated? It specifically goes to your documentation, grabs on, retrieves the answers from there, answers the question versus using whatever churn definition it finds on the internet. And that is really changes the experience of doing business with these kinds of models. Now we talked about a lot of great scenarios, right? But just like every technology, we'd be remiss to not have talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now the garbage in, garbage out. In that shiny dashboard example, if you gave it bad documentation, you will, your user will get bad apps. So it is more and more important now to create good documentation, accurate documentation, if you're going to build a model for this kind of model. Another one is if you do not give any documentation, it may find a random answer on the right hand corner. So it is also important to build an evaluation mechanism so that it checks for the accuracy of your answers. Now, another example is, so picture this, me and my partner are gone. Two days later, we go to our friend's place and she blurts out what made her back. Now, this is not my documentation. Her brain is an LLM that I did not have a chance to give her any information. I did not ask her, where are you going to store the data? How long are you going to store the data? And how are you going to use my data? Which is why it is important for as you start using LLMs with your own data to read these better than you've read your Apple OS or Google which I know you read very carefully. So look at it, how it's going to use your data, and it is completely different for different LLMs and regulation requirements on the network. Dependency is really, if you use LLMs for everything, what happens when LLMs go down? What, what happens if the system goes down? How do you continue to engage efficiently with the system? Then hallucination. So when I was building the Cascadia agenda bot, before I had fine-tuned it for the agenda, I thought I'll ask it a random question. And I asked it, who is the MVP of the conference? And that question itself doesn't make sense because that's not a very smart question. But nevertheless, LLMs want to really please you. They will never come, up, come up with an answer. So it said, the MVP of the conference is Emily Davis. And I immediately texted the snapshot to Emily saying, look, my bot thinks you're the MVP of this conference. 
which you totally believe. If you've heard Emily's talk, they're so amazing that I would believe that she's gonna make it to conference. And she comes back saying, well, that's a hallucination if I ever saw it. And that's the issue, right? You have to keep check for hallucination, see that it doesn't make, when it doesn't know an answer, making sure that it doesn't come up with other answers. You have to check for that. Then if you have bad information, it can also generate misinformation and it can spread that misinformation. And from our just lifetime of experiences, we know how harmful misinformation can be. Let's look at the ugly. Now, I have a surprise for you. Like, internet, it spoils your bias opinions. I know, I know. <laughs> came, it came as a shock to me as well, but it's true. And so if you've trained something on biased information, you have to accept so how do you again build evaluation teams and team bears to detect the outcome and make sure it is biased on the internet? LMs are extremely resource intensive and hence costly. And there, that can impact the environment as well, which there is a lot of research going on on how to make these compute less compute intensive by either improving compute efficiencies or building small language models instead of large language models. So there are there's a lot of key research going on in that. Then the ethical dilemma, which could seriously be its own five-hour talk about what should you use for motivation learning? What should you not use for motivation learning? How do you give credit where credit is due? And there are evolving regulations around that as well, both with organizations that are building these tools as well as the government. And it is a very cool space to just keep an eye out for how these are evolving because we're at the cusp of the, the technology developing really, really fast. Here's some of the resources that I mentioned. So one is Thomas, Thomas Mock's talk on using its co-pilot in your R studio. Then the other is how do you fine tune a chatbot if you're building it and how do you surface it in a Python or Python. And a really cool talk by Dylan Slate that I covered as well, which is how do you incorporate your chatbot into Chinese or R. And think about customer support, FAQ, chatbot, um, like the hello world of your building site. They are great for a step to understanding how these applications work, how can you bring them together, how do you understand their complexities, as well as repercussions of bad data input and bad good practices by doing so. And I'll leave you with this one last thought. I asked Chad GPD to complete this. When you have a hammer, it said everything looks like nails. Now there is so much hype around generative AI right now. I mean, everybody, including myself, is talking about it. But that doesn't mean that every scenario is generated AI or must be generated AI. You have a lot of tools in your toolkit, analytics, traditional ML, NLP, uh, dashboards, and now generated AI is also in your toolkit. Which tool you pull out to use really depends upon what is the impact that you're trying to make. Is there an outcome to your final product? And what is that business scenario that you're trying to build? So know that you now have this additional tool and look around you in where you can use Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we have time for a few questions, questions from the audience, or if you want, you can post on our Slack channel. Uh, either way. And then Brittany is going to help us out with the questions. Let me make sure. That, okay, it works. Um, is there any advice out there for? to help guide you to like which LOM to select? Because there's a lot of options out there. They have OpenAI, they have Claude, Grok. And so I wasn't sure what's, if there were any pre-existing frameworks that help making a decision for yourself. Yeah, that's a great question. There are a lot of these tools coming up very quickly. And some of these are fine-tuned for specific scenarios that they do really well. So which LOM to start with is really, which is the most accessible do you need to, how much do you need to pay for it? How is it storing your data? So check for all of that as you think about which one should you use with. I started with OpenAI to try to build my first bot just because it was very accessible. And there was a lot of content out there already that helped me understand how to build it quickly. Um, but there are these other fine-tuned bots like Mistral and all, uh, apps like Mistral and all that you can start using as well, depending upon your scenario.
Yeah, I, um, great presentation. And uh, I was really interested if you have any resources or advice on talking about evaluation. Like that seems like a really big piece of when, when have you reached an appropriate level of fine tuning and how can you think of like metrics wise that, okay, you, we obviously can see when there's a, a wrong scenario, but there's so many scenarios under the sun. So do you have any um, extra tips or resources on that? Evaluation is such an evolving field. A lot of the evaluation that we sometimes can do from LLM evaluating another LLM, that is itself one technique that is used. I will link to a lot of talks and I know it's, it's ironic, but I'll, I'll include talks and articles on that topic, but there are a lot of methods for evaluation that can be reasonable. And as you evaluate, there is like fine tuning versus retrieving, which of them works better. There's a lot of discussion around that as well. So I would always, like as you're building something, build it step by step. First use retrievals, then use fine tuning to see how is it changing your accuracy and how, it, how much is it changing your accuracy without you overfitting to your goals and making it like overload. So as you think about evaluation, keep those things in mind. Um, some LLMs, a lot of the LLM applications I'm hugging face, are fine-tuned for checking specific things in evaluation, like are you not squaring? Like remove square words from your output, like LLMs that would like specifically for things like that. So you can use these kind of LLMs as well to add evaluation into your process. Um, and of course, checking with a human evaluation that is the most common way to check is how accurate am I getting the answers? Initial evaluation should be done by humans before you add other Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, sure. All right. So again, great presentation. Right, nicely done. Um, one of the scenarios you talked about was real, uh, fraud detection. Um, and like within that model, there was real-time fraud detection. Yeah. Now, out of curiosity, was uh, w were you suggesting that the generative model would be performing the real-time fraud detection? Yes and no. So the real-time component of it is really in looking at a new scenario and figuring out that it is an anomaly faster in real time. So this is something that looks anomalous and should I add this to my bank of fraud detection and learn from that, that is the real-time component that I was mentioning. So, so yeah, I mean, it raises the question, you know, what is the, what is the relationship to traditional ML, ML look like on a go-forward basis? Yeah, yeah. The traditional, the, the key difference here with doing it with generative AI is that synthetic data component. When it looks at real-time fraud detection, if you use traditional ML, you have labeled certain instances as this is what fraud looks like. And you're bound within that labeled data set of what fraud scenarios look like. What generative AI is able to do beyond that is look at your true scenarios, but also make up other types of scenarios of what else the data could look like for it to be called fraud. And when you add that, it creates a bigger data set for you to learn from for generated AI to call something e fraud or not. And it is also able to learn from pure examples. So if you don't have a vast amount of data, fraud data is skewed in terms of how many fraud scenario happens. Let's say 0.1% of your data could be like your label data about fraud. So you need that synthetic data generation to increase that amount of data that you can learn from, which is where generated AI can help over traditional ML. Interesting. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. This is by far the best explained uh, presentation about what is AI and, and uh, everything that you said is great. I want to ask you a question that I've been asking to everyone that is interested in AI, kind of maybe the, the one that is a, a Cantonese, which is, you know, what do you think is going to be the impact of uh, the tools that we're seeing in, in the jobs of people like us. Yeah. Um, I was not expecting that question. No, I really, truly expected that question. Um, so there is a like very feature thing going out there with AI. Not AI. AI is not taking your jobs, but people who will use AI to advance their how they work will take your jobs. 
to be frank, there is like, think about two extremes, right? One extreme is AI helps you become efficient at your job. So you are up, able to up level yourself to moving from the nitty gritty that needed to be done that you have delegated to AI, and you're now able to focus on strategy and up level your job description. The other extreme is AI started doing the nitty gritty work for you, but there isn't an up level job available for you to be able to fill and so the job is gone. The reality of the scenario could be somewhere in between, where yes, there are certain jobs that you would be able to advance and up level based on what you're able to do with AI. So which is why it is important to make it part of your policy. And there is a burden on both people and employers as this AI technology is coming up to train their employees in how they use it and what that means to the definition of their job. Now, what is it more that they are able to do to jump out of it if not from them? So the reality is going to be somewhere in between. Then there are also going to be new jobs that will be created that we cannot see yet. And so dipping your toes into it is the best way to be ready and prepared for what those jobs could look like. An example could be a prompt engineer. Like, did not exist till two years ago, but now it is very relevant to know how to be a prompt engineer. Hope that helps.